Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. We begin as usual with the order of confession and forgiveness. So I'd ask that you turn to page 94 in the back of your or in the front of your worship book. And I invite those who can do so uh, without difficulty to please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. modern hymn is based on Samuel's response to God when he calls him, Here I am, Lord. So, 574, it was written by Shooting in 1946. And we should listen to God and respond to him and do what he asks us to do and say, Send us, Lord, here we are. I
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord.
Becky Demetroff will give the song. January 14, 2018. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending 
upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. One announcement to share with you, and that is uh, Ash Wednesday this year is on Valentine's Day, so it should be easy to remember. February 14th uh, is Ash Wednesday. As usual, we will have an afternoon and an evening service. I pray the weather is much better than this at that time, uh, but it's only like four weeks away, so preparing for them, but it will be honest before we know. Now I ask that you give your attention to the Lord.
and who is really following Jesus in their political agendas. Although we may recall that Jesus told us, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. In other words, as a Christian, we still are required to be a good citizen of our nation. We are to participate in the political process. We are, if called to do so, serve our brothers and sisters, our constituents in an elected office. But that is a secular calling. And then we render to God our faith, our priority. We render to God our life. But some churches want to make Jesus a politician instead of a savior. There are those churches that want to make Jesus Christ a solution for success rather than a savior. Just believe what I'm telling you and you'll be rich. Don't let this disappointment <coughs> bog you down. Just believe what I'm telling you and put that $100 check in the mail and you'll have just what you want. The prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all. Then there are churches that have made Christ a master motivator and not a savior. The world does not need a therapist. The world does not need a politician. The world does not need a solution for success. The world does not need a master motivator. The world needs a savior. It's just like I mentioned on Christmas Eve that one theologian had said if our need was financial, God would have sent us an economist. If our need was pleasure, he would have sent us an entertainer. Uh, if our need was more technology, he would have sent us a science. But the world that needed a savior, and that's what God sent us on Christmas Eve. And now we see that he has grown into a man and beginning the mission for which he was sent to work, to be the savior of the world. We must, we must and we must insist that the church return to the message that Jesus Christ is a seeking savior, seeking the lost for his kingdom. That is what Jesus is. That is why he came. Seek the Lord and to bring salvation to those who believe in Him. So we see in the first part of our gospel reading a seeking Savior, that this is who Jesus is. As we continue, we now see a seeking, a reaction to the seeking saved a follower of Jesus. As Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him about him Moses and the Lord. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Philip was not satisfied just to have been chosen by Jesus. He wasn't satisfied with just being part of the group. He didn't sit back in Bethsaida and say, Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm chosen by Jesus. Or he didn't sit around and say, Hey, you have to do this and that because I'm buddies with the big man. I've got the big guy on my side. No. Instead of once being chosen by Jesus, he immediately went out and showed an interest in all souls by coming to his friend Nathan. Following Jesus Christ means that we reach lost souls. That's what Father Christ calls us to do, to reach lost souls. The Great Commission, go to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. See, we, once we are in fellowship with Jesus, we are to go out and search for the lost. Reaching others through evangelism is evidence that salvation is real. 
Not only is it real, it is the most important aspect of our life. Everything in this world comes and goes. All the trophies, all the awards, and all the acclaim, it disappears. When I was a freshman in junior high school, I was Kentucky at that time, I uh, had that system where you went first grade to sixth, then seventh, eighth, ninth grade, junior high, and then 10th and 12th grade uh, for high school. So at the end of my ninth grade year, there was always this program in the, um, an organization in town gave out a trophy for a student of the year. And I was fortunate enough to have won the trophy. So I got this nice silver bowl with student of the year in Morton Junior High School, my name on it. I couldn't tell you where that trophy is now, but my life depends on it. You know, it's stuck somewhere, I don't know. I think we got it when Mom moved out of her house into where she's living now, but I don't know what we do with it once we got it. That's how temporary the things of the world are. But salvation is forever. That is why we have to be concerned about the lost. And now once Jesus calls us, then we turn around and reach out to others. An interesting fact about the church is that oftentimes new converts to the Christian faith reach more lost people than believers who grew up in the church all their life. And the same is true when people change denominations. I have witnessed this in my 40 years of ministry that uh, like I had my little sister had a, a best friend and her father was a convert to Roman Catholicism. He had grown up Baptist or something. And he became a Roman Catholic. He was the most fanatical Roman Catholic I ever knew. More fanatical and loyal to the teachings of the Catholic Church than some of my friends who were raised Catholic all their life. He would not violate any rule of the Catholic Church. And yeah, I had some Catholic friends who, like it's Lent, they're not supposed to eat meat on Friday, and somebody was having a birthday party or a birthday gathering of adults, and they were going to be some restaurant, and the uh, meal was going to be prime rib, and they would go and say, oh, we can break the no meat rule today. It's not really going to imagine. This dad of my sister's friend would never dream of it. I had a Catholic friend that said, yeah, the Pope says don't go to birth control, but he's not paying our bills, so we're going to pray his birth control. A lot of times a convert, so fanatical, they would never dream of doing it. And I, the interesting thing is, I observed this in my own ministry with converts from other denominations to becoming Lutheran. Especially when I was in Hopeful in Florence and Griffith, where I moved we moved from to here. In Kentucky, I had a number of Roman Catholic converts and a bunch of Baptist converts. And they were the most fanatical and loyal Lutherans that I had, more so than families in the church whose ancestors had actually started that church, having moved from Germany to Virginia and then come from Virginia to, to Northern Kentucky. Uh, these Baptist and Roman Catholics knew the small catechism inside out and backwards. They knew everything about Lutheran theology and tradition and practice and wanted to know more. And the same when I got to Griffith, where there the, the converts usually were from Roman Catholic or Orthodox tradition. It was up in that part of Indiana. There were, weren't very many big Baptist churches or other kind of churches like the prevalent in Kentucky and the South. So they would become fanatical. We, whether we grew up in the church or are a convert, should have that zeal to reach the law. To have that zeal to share the good news of Christ with others. Following Jesus Christ results in bringing others to follow Jesus Christ. So now we come to Nathaniel. Nathaniel is told by Philip that they have found the Messiah. And the 
Nathaniel responds by saying, well, first of all, Philip said one wrong thing in the eyes of Nathaniel when he spoke to him. He said, come and see, we have found him who Moses and the prophets has talked about, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. <clears throat> Nazareth. That was a bad word. See, Nazareth was a town where a Roman garrison was stationed. And usually where there was a Roman garrison, there was a lot of naughty behavior, let's put it that way, or non-religious behavior. And so basically, just as people have a tendency to do, anybody from Nazareth was painted with this brush, that they were immoral, that they weren't as religious uh, and faithful to the Jewish religion and practices as those who lived uh, in Judea instead of living in Galilee. And so Nathaniel's skeptical. What good, or can anything good, come out of Nazareth? Skepticism. It's a normal human trait. We shouldn't be surprised that those we approach with the gospel might at first be skeptical. Why? Because we grow up in a society where we're told you only receive what you earn. You only get what you work for. There's no free lunch. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, you want to get ahead, you have to work harder than others. And then the religions of the world tell you, well, in order to be saved, you have to do all these sacrifices and rituals and traditions and so forth. And you climb up the ladder and you make a mistake, you fall all the way back down to the bottom, you have to start all over again. And when you're lying there on your deathbed, you have no idea whether or not you've done enough good to get into heaven or not. And then along comes Jesus. And Jesus says, if you want forgiveness, if you want eternal life, there's nothing you can do. No matter how many bulls you sacrifice, you can sacrifice a whole pasture full of cattle. You can sacrifice a whole acre of produce. And you're still not going to make payment for one sin you've committed. But if you believe that on that first Good Friday, when I was nailed to the cross, that my blood made that payment for your sin. That my blood atoned for your sin and your error. And that if you believe that on that third day I rose again, and that 40 days later I ascended into heaven, if you believe that, you're saved. You believe that, you have salvation. As St. Paul said, Jesus Christ crucified was a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't go with the way the world goes. Because it's God that works, and not humanity. Humanity puts itself first. Humanity creates gods in our own image. But the real God created us in his image. And loving us so much provided the way of salvation. Grace by faith, apart from works of the law. So skepticism is often a first response. And so then Philip simply replies, come and see. He didn't argue with him. He just says, come and see. Again, when you look at the original Greek, this phrase, come and see, means to move from unbelief to belief. It means to, it is an invitation to discard preconceived notions and to believe in the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's what come and see is. It's to come and see Jesus for who he is. This was Philip's testimony. And an ounce of testimony is worth a pound of argument. So what happens too often when we Christians try to reach out to someone with the gospel and they're skeptical, begin we get in an argument with them. Instead of simply giving a simple testimony, come and see. 
Come and see for yourself. Hear the word of God and let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. Hear the Lord Jesus Christ knocking on your heart, asking to come in. And when one does that, they realize they have a sinning Savior who wants nothing but the best for them, and that best is forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. Jesus knows us before we know him. Nathaniel is amazed that Jesus knew all about him before they even came in contact with one another. And Jesus knows everything about us. He knows every secret. He knows every skeleton. He knows every accomplishment. He knows every joy. He knows every fear. He knows every apprehension. He knows every anxiety. He knows every victory. He knows every defeat and disappointment. So we can come to him just as we are. Just as that famous hymn says, just as I am. Works and all. Sins and all. We come because Jesus seeks us first. Jesus told Nathaniel all about himself. And he knows all about us. So the one thing, the most important thing to remember today is... When we recognize Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that he will make things new for us, a new life, a new priority, a new understanding, a new relationship with God, a new understanding of forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. And so we recognize Christ and all things become new for us and for all who come to Christ in faith. So we have a seeking Savior. We do not have one who is unconcerned about us. We do not have one who could care less about us. But we have one who is constantly seeking us. And as his followers, we constantly seek the lost to add to his kingdom. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We will now sing Tell Me the Story of Jesus, which is page 4 in your bulletin. If you would turn to it at this time, I need to uh, point out something. And if I get it wrong, please correct me. Uh, you sing the first verse, right? Okay, then at the bottom of the verses, you see refrain. After the first verse, we sing that refrain. Then we sing the second verse. We go back to that refrain, sing the third verse, then that refrain. We don't sing the refrain first, and then the verses, or the refrain once. We sing the refrain after each verse. So, that is the road map. Tell me the story of Jesus. This hymn was written by Fanny J. Crosby in 1868. She was a blind hymn writer. It's called the Queen of gospel writing. She wrote a hymn a week. She could sometimes write a hymn in 20 minutes. Saving the Arms of Jesus is very inspired and could uh, write, could uh, portray Jesus very quickly. He took people and made them feel safe in the arms of Jesus. This is Safe in the Arms of Jesus, 1868. We sing it. As Fanny Crosby wrote it. She wrote a hymn a week. Very famous hymn writer. American.
conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray that the radiance of Christ will illumine the church, the nations, and all who seek the law. Our response today is hear our prayers. Let us pray for the church that it might have a sense of urgency in its proclamation, and that the world may know of God's love for the whole creation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all bishops, pastors, associates in ministry, deaconesses, and diaconal ministers, that they might hear the word of God and have courage for their task of proclamation and service. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who seek to find the common ground between Peoples of the world who are divided by nation, race, religion, or any other walls. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all in need, those who are facing illness, those who are grieving losses, those who are unemployed, those to whom death draws near. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are teachers in our parish and community, that they might responsibly lead and nurture us in ways of wisdom, knowledge, and fear the Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let us pray in thanksgiving for the lives of all who have died, and especially those most dear to us, that we will be kept united with him while we live and when we die. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our spoken and silent prayers, O God of light, and reveal yourself to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Time for our offering. Remember, us here at St. John's Lutheran Church. And this is January 14th, 2018. We are today studying Jesus' role as the seeking Savior as He seeks us for salvation. We need to be assured that we have a Savior, that we are saved. We believe and we are saved. Jesus will be with us forever and we have eternal life. It's the second Sunday after Epiphany, January the 14th, 2018. It's the wonderful lesson today. We're going to have the service of the Word, and we don't have Holy Communion this Sunday. Next Sunday we'll have Holy Communion. But today we're studying the Word, and the Word is the way, the way we learn about who Jesus is, and we accept Him as Savior, and then we are saved. He becomes Lord of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for doing this for us. We thank you for saving us. We're not deserving of it, but we thank you, Lord, that you save us even in our sin. Forgive us. Flowers are given by Pastor and Gina in honor of Pat Pollock's 94th birthday, in memory of Gina's sister, Charlene Schwartz Miller. Flowers are also presented by Nelson Klopfenstein in loving memory of the birthday of Ruth Klopfenstein on January 7th. Can you invite those who can do so without difficulty to please me? Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, keep you in his light and truth and love, now and forever.
Amen. We conclude our worship with a Christ called to baptize in number 575. In number 575. In Christ Called to Baptize. It was written by a woman. A lot of these hymns are written by women. This is written by Ruth Duck, born in 1947, and the music is a Welsh melody. In Christ Called to Baptize. And we want to witness to others. We thank God that we are baptized and we are saved. In Christ Called to Baptize. This service is from St. John's Lutheran Church. We thank you for watching us on YouTube. You're welcome to come and worship with us. We'd love to have you. And these are some of the best people in Clark County who are worshiping God and are worthy enough through Jesus Christ, through His grace, to minister to others. We give food to the hungry. We give whatever is needed. Jesus invites us to give to others just as we would to him. When we give to others, we're giving to him. We have our service here at 8 o'clock in the morning on uh, Sunday and 10.30 service. Every Sunday, we invite you to come and join us. We have Holy Communion celebrating the first and third Sunday of every month festivals and each Wednesday, Wednesday evening. We hope that you received blessing, that you received Jesus as your Savior during the service today, and that he will be with you forever. You are, have salvation great gift of salvation you were saved you receive eternal life you come and take communion and you receive eternal life and you also bless the world by doing this today's readings show that jesus christ is our redeemer his countless blessings he gives to us and benefits we know that he loves us he will be and we ask that we would love him more dearly follow him more nearly and day by day Praise Him. This written uh, verse about following Jesus more clearly day by day was written by a knight during the Middle Ages. We had a great feeling of day by day, every single day, every single breath we take. Jesus is with us. 
He is part of us and we are part of his body and other people. We want to tell the story of Jesus and we thank Jesus for our salvation, that he is our Savior. We ask you to come and take Jesus into your heart, make him Lord of your life. We hope you did during the broadcast and we hope that you will come and continue to bless others as we receive Jesus' love and give his love to others. In Jesus' name, we thank you for coming. We pray that God will bless you. We'll pray for you. Pray for us. God bless you. And you are every minute with Jesus. Amen.